All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Evan Verplu, and I serve as the Executive Director for the International Relations Council. Um, thank you so much for joining us for what's happening in Moldova. Um, we're so happy to have you with us today, um, and we appreciate your, your time and um, your willingness to, to hear on, on this topic. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. Um, as a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Um, whether you're joining us live today or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including our other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. Um, with so much going on right now in the world, um, it's, it's frankly somewhat easy to um, lose track, um, you know, especially in places that have either fallen out of the, the headlines where news stories are increasingly complicated or or areas of the world that frankly just don't get get covered enough. Um, we can't predict the future, but we do know the importance of understanding historical background and cur current global context. Um, no matter your level of expertise, the IRC um, offers this uh, What's Happening program um, to our engaged community um, for area experts um, to give meaningful explorations on some particularly active parts of the globe. Um, so we'll hope you'll uh, deepen your global knowledge and nuance your understanding of what's happening today in Moldova. Um, today, we're very, very pleased to be uh, joined by Stephen Youngblood, who's the director at the Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University and currently is a Fulbright Scholar in Moldova. Um, he'll be presenting this program for, for the next hour, um, and we very much encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions throughout the program. The last 15 minutes or so will be reserved to um, have those questions addressed, um, so we'll hope you'll, you'll stay engaged with us in, in that um, manner. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and... Um, now pass things over to to, to Stephen. Um, just the, some more information about uh, Stephen Youngblood. Again, he's the director of Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University, um, where he is a communications professor. He's organized and taught peace journalism seminars around the world. Um, he's a two-time uh, Fulbright scholar, including his current um, current stay in Moldova. Um, he's the author of Peace Journalism: Principles and Practices. Um, he's been recognized for his contributions to the world uh, to world peace by the U.S. State Department. I and mean, he's also a member of the Parkville Rotary Club. So Stephen, thank you so much for, for joining us there in Moldova uh, this evening. And uh, thank you so much. And please, please take it away. Thank you, Evan. And uh, good evening from Moldova, where it's uh, where it's 8 p.m. Uh, so not too late. I'm not uh, groggy quite yet. Um, as Evan mentioned, uh, I am a Fulbright Scholar here in Moldova. So uh, in tonight's program, <laughs> pardon me for a moment. Uh, tonight's program, we're going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing in Moldova. We'll start with that. And then just a little bit of background about the country itself, about Moldova, pardon me, particularly as a target for disinformation and the impacts of that. And finally, um, uh, some thoughts about why we should care. So what am I doing in Moldova? Well, I am a J. William Fulbright Scholar. So the Fulbright program has several, there are several different aspects of the Fulbright program. So one type of Fulbright is uh, where they send students abroad, uh, graduate students to study in other countries. A second type of Fulbright is when the US State Department sends abroad professors. So it's a it's a, a process that's uh, from uh, application to selection is something like a year and a half. And I decided to select Moldova because I had had some experience here before. I speak the language a little bit. Um, and I thought, given what's going on in Moldova, what you'll hear about tonight, uh, that it was would certainly be interesting ground for my project. So while I'm here in Moldova, uh, I'm teaching uh, classes at the State University of Moldova. I'm also working very closely with an organization called 
Central Media Pentrutinery, which means the Youth Media Center. So, I'm, so along with them, uh, I'm traveling throughout Moldova, talking with uh, high school age students, essentially, about uh, media and responsible media and peace media and so on. I'm working with an organization called the Moldova Journalism School, where I've taught a course. Um, I'm going to be doing some work with the UN through the ONCHR, uh, which is the uh, organization for the High Commissioner for Refugees. I've done some guest speaking gigs at universities outside of Chisinau, the capital. Uh, I've really had a lot of fun working with uh, students at a middle school. So I've taught a couple of lessons on disinformation at hates and hate speech at a place called Horizont Lyceum, Horizons uh, Lyceum. And finally, I may be doing some work with uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace in the not too di distant future, uh, working on some, um, some launching some projects uh, here in Moldova. So let's talk a little bit about Moldova then. What do you need to know about Moldova? <clears throat> well, in terms of history, Moldova was a former Soviet republic that, like the other Soviet republics, gained its independence in, 2000, in 1991. Now, you see from the map uh, Moldova's geography. And Moldova is surrounded on three sides. Surrounded is the wrong word. It's bordered on three sides by Ukraine. Uh, there is a sliver of Moldovan territory that you see here marked in color called Transnistria. So in 1993, a brief war was fought over Transnistria between Moldova and so-called separatists. Uh, however, the Russians supplied the separatists, uh, boosted the separatists, much the same way we've seen them doing in the Donbass, even before uh, this particular war started. So as a result of this war, uh, Transnistria declared its independence in 1993. Now, it's an independence that no one recognizes, not even Russia. So it's this de facto state that exists in a sort of limbo. And it's a, a de facto state that would never exist without Russia. So Russia props them up economically, and there are 1,500 Russian troops on Transnistrian territory. So if you're in the capital of Moldova, uh, the 50 miles between here and the capital of Transnistria, uh, it can be a little unnerving to know that there are Russian troops stationed this close uh, to Moldova. So another characteristic of Moldova is that it's a very polarized society. So, you, so here in Moldova, you have a majority of Moldovans who are Romanian speaking, as I am. I, I'm not a great Romanian speaker, but it, it's adequate. Uh, there's a minority of uh, Moldovans who are Russian speaking. And this is a real split, a real divide in society. Um, so you have uh, Romanian speakers supporting Ukraine, supporting the West, generally supporting EU. And you have Russian speakers feeling the opposite way. So this was a recent survey that just came out for example, that shows that 21% of Moldovans say that Russia was justified to invade Ukraine. Imagine that. And 31% say, <clears throat> say that Russia is a guarantor of peace for Moldova. Now, in my opinion, nothing could be further from the truth on either one of those. And I think that those opinions speak to the propaganda that's been pumped into the Russian speakers here in Moldova. Now, in terms of the impact of the war, uh, other than Ukraine, of course, there are very few countries that have been impacted the way that Moldova has been impacted. So according to a World Bank report, and I quote, Moldova is one of the countries most affected by the war in Ukraine, not only because of its physical proximity, but also because of its inherent vulnerabilities as a small landlocked economy with close linkages to both Ukraine and Russia. 
So what does this war impact look like? Well, first and foremost, it looks like an energy crisis for Moldova, which has been traditionally very heavily dependent on Russian gas. Uh, last year, once the war started, as the Russians started turning the spigot off when they could see that the when Russia could see that Moldova was supporting Ukraine, um, there were energy deficits here in Moldova. So last year, last winter, there were regular blackouts and brownouts here in Moldova. Now, not that this is scientific, but I've been here about two months and the power hasn't been off once. Uh, so that's because Moldova has been able to buy its energy. Uh, it's taken some time, but has been able to make up for that lo lost Russian energy. Now, the, the dark side to that is that gas is now four times more expensive, natural gas, which is used to, for everything here in Moldova, uh, heating, electricity, and so on, is now four times more expensive, which means that for the average Moldova, uh, this creates a very difficult situation. In fact, according to the UNDP, 60% of Moldova's population live in what they call energy poverty, which means that they spend 10% uh, of their budgets on energy bills. Uh, I've been told this winter to expect, to expect my heating bill uh, to be up to, and for my small one bedroom apartment, to be up to 250 euros a month. Um, I can pay that, but for the average Moldovan, I, and especially in a bigger housing unit, you can imagine how difficult that is. Uh, one of the things that's helped Moldova with energy is that $300 million in USAID money uh, has come from uh, the U.S. and additional aid from the EU to help offset uh, these energy uh, issues here in Moldova. There have also been security incidents as a result of the war. Uh, so Mold uh, a Moldovan diplomat told NPR earlier this year, and I quote, of all of Ukraine's neighbors, Moldova is closest to the battlefields. Russia's cruise missiles overfly Moldova airspace. And indeed, Ukrainian intercept missiles have also landed in Moldova. Russian missile debris have fallen on Moldovan territory several times, so we have encountered a number of significant security incidents. Moldova has not been attacked, but Moldova is certainly in a position where an errant missile, um, a, a downed aircraft uh, could crash here and could create a, a real international incident. Uh, add to this the fact that there are over 100,000 Ukrainian refugees here in Moldova. Uh, by American standards, that's a fairly small number. But remember, Moldova has just 2.6 million people. So for a, for a small country um, and not a rich country, 100,000 is a lot of refugees. And finally, according to Moldova's government, in large part because of the war, uh, the Russian government, according to President Maya Sandu, has been trying to undermine uh, Moldova's government. Uh, she er, earlier in this year, earlier this year, talked to media about a plan for a coup d'état in Moldova that included sabotage, that include that included military people disguised as civilians to carry out violent attacks, attacks on government buildings, taking hostages and so on. So President Sandu actually went public with this, uh, which I thought was really interesting, but certainly there's this constant pressure from Russia, pressure politically. So the Russian government supports, um, supports uh, opposition, uh, political parties, so there's this political pressure, there's military pressure from the troops in Transnistria, and certainly there's economic pressure as well. Against all these odds, during the war, uh, Moldova has been granted what it is long sought, which is candidate status in the EU, which means essentially that they're sort of in line to become EU members, along with Ukraine. Ukraine's also in line. 
So the target date on that is 2030. Uh, the people I've talked to here in Moldova think that might be possible, but of course there are a number of EU hoops that Moldova has to jump through first. Uh, here in Moldova, corruption uh, is a very large problem. And, that, and that's one of the things uh, near the top of the list that, uh, that needs to be addressed before the EU becomes a reality here uh, in, in Moldova. So another impact of the war, and I should say that, of course, before the war, there was Russian disinformation aimed at Moldova. But in terms of the volume, the severity, the tone of this disinformation, all of that has picked up significantly uh, since, since the war started. So uh, there's a recent report called Blurring the Truth from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation that looked at Russian disinformation in Eastern Europe. And here's what it had to say about Moldova. Torn between integrating with the West or remaining in Russia's orbit, Moldova is particularly vulnerable to Russian propaganda. The propaganda circulating in the country focuses particularly on disenfranchising NATO, the European Union, and the West in general. This phenomenon triggers political polarization within Moldovan society, which influences the public agenda and decision-making processes in the country. Moreover, Russian disinformation undermines the security and ordinary democratic procedures in the country, all the while undermining confidence in state institutions. In the context of the war in Ukraine, as well as during COVID, the scale of this phenomena is being felt massively with news that intentionally misinforms the public and has a significant impact on the public's perception and thus has real life consequences for Moldova. So you see before you some of the themes of Russian disinformation. And you know, essentially, uh, so let me go over these real quickly. So one theme has to do with Transnistria. Uh, Russian disinformation that talks about Transnistria perhaps invading, Transnistria perhaps joining Russia. So if Moldova joins the EU, Transnistria will, will become a Russian province and so on. Russian disinformation also talks about President Sandu uh, as an enemy of the Russian speakers, as a warmonger, as a puppet of the West, of the US and the EU. Russian propaganda also here in Moldova likens the EU to NATO and talks about how both are warmongers and in fact blames the Ukraine war on NATO. This propaganda talks about how the EU is bad for Moldova, that Moldova won't fit into the EU, that it will be an economic catastrophe, that the EU will prey on and take advantage of Moldova and so on. Uh, one of the interesting themes of this disinformation is that joining the EU uh, is uh, embracing a uh, embracing a so-called gay agenda. Uh, so uh, the Rus or the Russian propaganda says that if Moldova joins the EU, that it's abandoning its family values. Um, and that it's promoting uh, this homosexual agenda. And finally, it talks about how Moldova uh, should not increase their ties with Romania, which is an EU country, and that this indeed would be, uh, would be bad news for Moldova. So one easy example of Russian propaganda and disinformation is the picture that you see here on your screen. So this is a picture of a rally that was held in May 2023. 80,000 people turned out in the government square here in Chisinau, the capital, in support of President Sandu, in support of the European Union. So the Russians took this picture and flipped it completely around in Russian media and on, on uh, social media as well. Uh, they show this picture and they said, here are 80,000 Moldovans protesting against, 
President Sandu, protesting against the EU, protesting because they want to join with Mother Russia. So there's not even any nuance or gray area a lot of times to the propaganda. I mean, the propaganda here is essentially that up is down, black is white, and left is right. So that's a, a little bit of a look at, at Russian propaganda. And, and during my stay here, you know, it's one of the things that, that I'm definitely, um, one of the areas that I'm concentrating on. So this propaganda and, and media coverage in general is fueling polarization here in Moldova. And you see the quote on your screen that these narratives exacerbate polarization between Transnistria and Moldova, between pro-EU, pro-Sandu, anti-EU, pro-Russia forces. And that it's undermining social cohesion by increasing aggressiveness and the willingness to engage in political violence. If some of this sounds familiar to us as Americans, it probably should. I just saw the poll today that said 25% of Americans think political violence is acceptable. That was pretty frightening. Uh, furthermore, uh, back to Moldova, uh, media polarization can have a powerful influence to undermine support for human rights and the harmonious co coexistence between different linguistic groups. So the pro-Russia, the Russian speakers and the Romanian speakers that we talked about earlier. So the Adenauer report in a general way talks about the impacts of disinformation, that it does trigger this political polarization. And, and it doesn't only trigger it, it sustains it and maintains it. So any chance that Moldovans might have to build bridges across these linguistic boundaries, those opportunities are scuttled by all the disinformation, particularly uh, on, on the Russian side. Uh, as President Sandu mentioned, it undermines the security of the country. So if Russia did attempt to stage a coup d'etat here, 30% uh, of Moldovans approximately uh, would, would doubtless have a positive view of that. And that's from a security standpoint, that's certainly a dangerous thing for Moldova. By undermining confidence in state institutions, then um, it's, it's hard to explain to the 30% minority that they are indeed the subjects of dis and misinformation. Uh, again, if you're thinking of parallels to the US, um, it's, it's, it, it's kind of interesting and maybe even a little scary. And certainly, a <clears throat> disinformation has a significant impact on public perceptions. So you see, you know, almost a direct line that we can draw between the disinformation and the disinformation narratives and the pro-Russian, Russian-supported politicians who are trying to push Moldova back into Russia's orbit. So essentially, there are two competing narratives. The pro-Russia narrative that Russia is a stabilizing force, that Russia is the victim uh, in the Ukraine war, uh, that Russia is good for Moldova, and the opposite narrative, that Russia is a threat to Moldova, uh, that Russia seeks to undermine Moldova, that Russia wants to rule Moldova as a satellite. Well, according to a report from USAID, both of these narratives, the pro-Russia and the anti-Russian narratives, they both damage social cohesion. So any chance that Moldova has, as I said, to come together and, and to really create a cohesive, a socially cohesive company, uh, country is really dashed by this uh, political polarization. Uh, and, and the media. So why should we, getting to, I'm sorry, getting to the nitty gritty question, the question of the subject of today's discussion, why should we care? Well, 
in my opinion, one reason why we should care is that Moldova really is at the crossroads. Think of the United States in 1775. Think of the United States in 1860. We're at that kind of point in Moldovan, in Moldova's brief history. And there are two roads here. One road, the road being pursued by President Sandu and her report and her supporters, is a road that leads to EU, is a road that leads to a productive, re peaceful rela relationship with Moldova's uh, partners to the West. And one hopes it's the road to economic development as well. At least certainly there's there have been a number of studies shown, uh, uh, studies that show that Moldova would economically benefit uh, from becoming an EU member. So one road leads west, the other road leads east. So there are forces in Moldova, pro-Russian forces, some of them supported directly by Russia, there are examples of this, there's a political party that was called the Shore Party, spelled S-O-R, but pronounced Shore. So the Shore Party was shown to be directly supported by Russia. So that party was officially banned by Moldova, but its supporters remain. And they've changed their name, but it's the same old thing. So you have the Shore Party and its supporters leading the way east to, if not unification with Russia, then something like Belarus has, uh, something like uh, a, a Russian satellite, where Russian proxies rule the country, where any wealth that the country has is siphoned off by Russia, where Russia becomes, in essence, a vassal state. Again, think Belarus. So this is a really vitally important point in Moldovan history. And you can tell which way I think Moldova should turn. And right now, the majority of Moldovans and the president agree with that stance, but it's on shaky ground. And these dark forces uh, sponsored by, encouraged by, by direct Russian action, by disinformation, those forces at any moment could undermine the government, take control, and we could do an about face and be headed towards a, a very, in my opinion, a very dark future. So why we should care is also about Transnistria. So what's gonna happen in Transnistria? Is it going to become independent? Is it going to become part of Moldova? Will it become a Russian satellite state? So if Transnistria becomes a Russian satellite state, what are the implications for Moldova, for the EU? And what happens to Transnistria's 1,500 Russian troops? Certainly, th that uh, question has people on pins and needles here in Moldova. You know, will, will those, early in the Ukraine war, there were rumors that ended up being nothing but rumors, that those 1,500 troops might uh, cross over into Moldova and expand the war here or that those 1,500 troops would join the fight in Ukraine. Neither one of those things has happened. So those 1,500 troops for now are on solid ground in Transnistria. Why we should care? Uh, we put a lot of money in Moldova. Between 1992 and 2023, USAID has spent $640 million in Moldova trying to boost the economy, trying to uh, create an environment here where development is possible, trying to develop um, democratic institutions. So a lot of the work that I've done in Moldova is about trying to develop a free and vibrant press. So whether I'm teaching at the university, working with youth media, working with the Independent Journalism Center, you know, one of my personal goals here is to create a vibrant atmosphere here 
uh, for press. And it's not just United States aid that, that has come to Moldova. In 2022 alone, the EU sent almost 300 million euros here to Moldova. Again, for development, uh, to help Moldovans pay for energy, as we talked about, and so on. Uh, so the EU certainly has a stake in this uh, as well. So this is a quote uh, that I thought I would leave you with before we get to the Q&A. So if you haven't put your uh, questions in uh, the Q&A, please do so. Uh, this is from uh, uh, the Brookings Institution. Moldova matters because the U.S. is committed to a policy of, of a Europe whole, free, and at peace, really since the end of the Cold War, and consolidating democracy and good government. And Moldova is a pretty sore spot. It's the poorest country in Europe. It's the site of very high corruption. It's the site of Russian influence. This is certainly something that should concern the US and its democratic allies. So we should care about Moldova because we have a stake in the success of democratic countries around the world. It's certainly why we're fighting in Ukraine, and it should be why we can, why we should, in my opinion, continue to support Moldova, because a free EU member Moldova uh, is going to be an ally and a trading partner for the United States, and is going to be from a security standpoint and and an Eastern Wall uh, against Russian uh, expansionism and influence. So before I get to the questions, let me get, give you my contact information. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm the director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism. You see my uh, email address there. Feel free to email me at any time. Uh, you also see the address there of my blog. Uh, so I'm regularly blogging about my activities here in Moldova. So if you'd like to continue following uh, what I'm doing, uh, you can find me at Stephen Youngblood, my name, dot blogspot dot com. So at this point, Evan, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, and I know that we must have some good uh, questions from the audience. Yes, we, we certainly do. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Steve, for taking the time. That was a wonderful overview. Um, so yeah, we've got we've got some questions and we do invite anybody who does have, have questions to continue submit them uh, to submit them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll try to get through um, as many as we can. Um, so I'll just go in, um, in order here. Um, Baruch says, on a scale of one to 10, how likely would you say is the chance of unification between Moldova and Romania? Do you see Moldova joining the EU without a unification, without a unification with Romania? Oh, I think you're on mute. Thank you. That's a very good question. So early in, let's just say in the first 10 years of Moldova's existence, um, there were some real questions about the vi viability of Moldova as a country. So is Moldova uh, the material for, you know, does it have the prerequisites to be an independent country? And during that time, there was a lot of discussion about unification with Romania. This is something, but, but at the time, it was certainly not politically possible. I would say now uh, that, the focus is on the EU, uh, that really the talk of unification with uh, Romania has not just been taken off the front burner, it's been taken off the burners at all. Uh, there's really very little discussion about unification with Romania because Moldova's uh, agreement with the EU uh, doesn't even reference Romania, that Russia, that, that Russia, that Moldova can join the EU as an independent country on its own two feet. And right now, that's what, what's going to happen, at least we hope. Gotcha. 
Thank you so much. Um, Dan says, how do um, how do the Romanians play a role? Are more pro EU Moldovans closer to the Romanian Romania border and more pro Russia Moldovans closer to the Transnistria? Uh, to Transnistria, I suspect the outcome of the Ukraine-Russian war will have a huge impact on Moldova and the region in general. So. Okay, that, that's good, Dan. So the role that Romania plays is as Moldova's chief advocate in the EU. So Moldova, uh, so Romania really pushed for Moldovan membership, has been um, assisting Moldova technically to help Moldova jump through these EU hoops that I talked about. So there, there are, right now, there are uh, uh, NGOs here in Moldova that are working with the Romanian government that's giving Moldova advice about how Moldova can meet these EU requirements. In terms of where the pro-Russian speakers are located, um, I think, uh, geographically, uh, they're they're located mostly uh, here in Chisinau, the capital, in Belts, which is in the north, and in a uh, a place called Gagauzia in Comrat in the south. Um, but we're talking about, and I've seen different surveys on this, 20, 20 to thirty percent. You know, in terms of the outcome of the war. Um, I, I do think it's going to have an impact on Moldova. I'm just not sure what that is. I don't think as long as uh, the, the Sandu government can maintain its support, I don't think anything is going to steer them away from the EU course. So even if, God forbid, Russia were to uh, conquer Ukraine or to at least keep many of its current Ukrainian possessions, um, I think, if anything, that would make Moldova more determined uh, to, to look into EU. And by the way, something that I didn't mention, so the Moldovan constitution um, specifies uh, military neutrality. So by its own constitution, Moldova could not join EU. And from a geopolitical standpoint, it's probably smart anyway that Moldova not do this. So at some point, if you're Moldova, how far, how much do you antagonize Russia? So would joining NATO be a bridge too far? We don't know that. Uh, but, but certainly I think EU would give Moldova an aura of security that they don't have now. Thank you. Okay, um, this is from Cynthia. Um, can you speak to the status of the Moldovan judiciary? I hosted a Moldovan judge and she uh, would go to Greece and work as a maid because she hadn't been paid for a long time. Also, can you speak to the issue of human trafficking? Right, so I, so I, I, I don't have any firsthand knowledge of the judiciary, but what you say is about civil servants, teachers and so on being grossly underpaid, um, I mean, the, the, that's certainly true. And so one of, one of the hoops that Moldova has to jump through is to develop their economy to the point where uh, civil servants, and especially judges, uh, can be paid to guarantee their independence. In terms of human trafficking, <clears throat> Transnistria particularly has, has always been a hub for the trafficking of everything, of munitions, of uh, human trafficking, and of, um, it, it's been reported, even nuclear materials. So one of the reasons why we should care about Transnistria uh, is, th is that it has the potential, uh, well, not just the potential, is that it's um, a bridge between the darker forces in Asia and uh, the European Union. Wonderful, thank you. Um, 
from Suzanne, we have, what are the chances of Transnistria-based troops being used to attack Odessa? Well, I'm not a military expert, um, so I, I wouldn't speculate about the chances. I would, I, you know, the best evidence that we have about these troops is the fact that they haven't been used yet. Um, so, I, I mean, we're... So I, 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 I'm not sure what else, to, what else I can say about that. It is just, I mean, 1,500 troops on Moldovan soil, you know, 50 miles from where I'm sitting, of course, it's a concern. But in the big picture of the Ukraine war, 1,500 troops is really a very small number. It's a drop in the bucket. Uh, not enough. And we could get a military expert. But I, I don't think enough to really make a substantial difference one way or the other. So the, the best predictor we have is the fact that they haven't moved from there since the war started. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. And then from Michael, we have, outside of economic factors, what may be the greatest or more attractive interests of the Moldovans of great Western influence or engagement in their country? Well, I, I you... It's hard. It's hard to dismiss the economic factors because they are reasons one through ten that the EU is attractive, right? Uh, that it's unfettered trade, uh, that it's uh, EU development money, um, even more than they've gotten. I mean, it's it's all of these things. So the economic factors are by far uh, the most significant factors. Now, of course, uh, one of the things that makes uh, the the EU attractive is the the Shenzhen region, right, where there's unfettered travel among EU countries, and that's certainly uh, something that's that's a, attractive to Moldovans as well. But I think by far the most important reasons all have to do with the economy, with development, and so on. Sure, that makes sense. Um, you know, and and kind of. Somewhat related to that, I'll jump down just a little bit. Kai is asking about the economy of Moldova, dominating sectors, import, export, et cetera. Okay, so I, I'm no expert on this, but but uh, Moldova's primary export is wine. Uh, so Moldova's a uh, uh, makes, uh, and I'm believe me, I'm no wine expert, but um, you know makes uh, some some of the best wine in Europe. I mean, I don't, I don't. I won't, I won't compare it, but uh, they make a lot of wine and a lot of very good wine, all of which, or most of which used to be imported to Russia. Russia completely cut that off. Mm -hmm. So they're looking and have been looking to new markets for their wine. So not just wine, but, <clears throat> pardon, but other agricultural products as well, fruits, vegetables. So the... Uh, the soil here is uh, miraculously rich, uh, which means that Moldova can be the way that Ukraine was, uh, a bit of a breadbasket uh, for Europe. Um, there's some light manufacturing, some technology things, uh, but right now it's primarily wine and agricultural products. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh... Let's see. This is um, again kind of kind of in the, the department. Uh, what commercial interests are located in Transnistria? Um, what role have Russian businessmen, industrialists, and former Soviet bureaucrats played in the Transnistrian secession movement? So, so the Transnistrian se se secession movement is the Russian Transnistrian secession movement. So everything is controlled by. For, for the benefit of Russia. Um, so Transnistria has always been ruled by uh, one family um, or several families, oligarchs essentially in the Russian style of oligarchy um, who, who benefit from, uh, who benefit from as much graft as they can take. So Transnistria is very much a kleptocracy. So Transnistria, um, has several large power plants. And so a lot of the, the power in Moldova proper goes to Transnistria. Uh, they also ha have some light industry. Uh, they produce uh, cognac and wine as well. 
uh, Transnistria would not have, uh, would not be viable in any sense of the word were it not propped up economically by Russia. Gotcha. Yeah, and 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 Bob on that on that kind of line asked, how much does the outcome of Russia's invasion of Ukraine impact Moldova, for example, contracts for electrical power, gas, water, et cetera, coming from Ukraine? Right. Well, um, so the in terms of energy, that's already pretty much been resolved because all of that gas came from Russia and that spigot's been turned off. So now Moldova is already looking westward. So regardless of what happens in the war, I mean, I can't see Moldova ever going back to Russia as a supplier of gas, uh, particularly given the history. And the history was whenever uh, Moldova would do something to upset Russia, Russia might slow down the gas or double the price. They're very capricious supplier, let's put it that way. And Gazprom, the, the Russian gas entity, uh, very much used gas for political blackmail. So, so Moldova's, Moldova will never go back to getting, to getting gas from um, Russia. Now, in terms of trade, yes, Ukraine uh, was and is a large trading partner. Um, and, and I'm sure that um, when the war is over, that that uh, trading partnership will continue. So Evan, if I could pluck a question uh, off of the chat that, that kind of interests me. Yes. Uh, Joel asks, how does Moldova as a democracy justify banning a political party, the shore party? And here's how they do it. So they do it using the same law that we use in the United States. So we have a law, and I don't know the name of it, but trust me, we have a law that permits that, I'm sorry, that prohibits, prohibits foreign contributions to politicians and political parties. So Moldova has that same law. Moldova was able to prove that the shore party was taking Russian money and in fact, taking direct direction from Russia. So using this law, they were then able to ban the shore party. Now, whether we think that's a fair law or not, we could discuss it. But the Moldovan law looks and sounds a lot like the US law on the same subject. Gotcha, that makes sense. Um... You know, we we have this question about uh, you know, kind of your your general impressions. What have you learned the, the culture and the people of Moldova from your from your time time being there? So, uh, I first came to Moldova, and this is my third Fulbright scholarship. So my my first one was in Moldova in two thousand one. My second was in Azerbaijan in two thousand seven, and now I've returned to Moldova again. It be, between two thousand one and about two thousand twelve. I came back to Moldova four or five times. Um, so I've spent a lot more time in Moldova than just these last two months. And the question I get asked all the time is, how is Moldova different now than it was in 2001? And the short answer is, it's as different as night and day. So in 2001, when I landed here, it was like landing in the Soviet Union. It was, everything was very Soviet, very Russian. Uh, it was dark and depressing <laughs> and the people were pessimistic. Uh, it was a very difficult place to be. 22 years later, Moldova, Kishino particularly, the capital is very European. So there's a patisserie on every corner. There's a coffee shop everywhere. Uh, the roads are in much better shape than they used to be. There's good public transportation. Um, and there's a feeling in the air that's a lot different than 2001. I think despite the war, that there's a lot of optimism here, especially among the young people who see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
And for Moldova, that light at the end of the tunnel is EU. So what do I think of Moldova? Um, well, I, I'm having a hard time not getting fatter because the food is quite good um, and it's cheap. Uh, you know, a good restaurant meal, two or three courses might be $10. Mm -hmm. So certainly by our standards, that's cheap, right? Um, the only reason I'm not getting extremely fat is that I'm walking a million miles a day. So unlike Kansas City, as you know, you you can't get anywhere without a car. Uh, you don't need a car here. And so I walk to the university. It's 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. Just fine with me. I see someone's asked about tourism. And, you know, Moldova has a lot of potential for tourism. A couple of weeks ago, the annual Moldovan Wine Festival was held where they close off the main street there were 95 wine vendors. And you buy a ticket, you get a little booklet that gives you 12 wine tastings. Now, it's not 12 glasses. The wine tastings like a quarter of a glass or something, just a little bit. But still, uh, and there was all kinds of food and traditional bands. I mean, uh, it, it, that would be a fun weekend trip for anyone. Uh, the countryside is really beautiful. So I just spent uh, last weekend at a resort on a lake. And it's just so pretty. And especially this time of year, it's especially pretty. Almost as pretty as Park University. If you haven't been up to Parkville and Park University during the fall, do yourself a favor, head up there. This message brought to you by the Parkville Chamber of Commerce. But anyway, Moldova. Um, I really think it has a lot of potential as a tourist spot. But the, I, the war needs to end first. People are nervous about coming here. They probably shouldn't be. I, I haven't felt in danger at all at any time, but I can understand the trepidation. So I think once the war is resolved, uh, and especially when Moldova gets into the EU, I think you're going to see a real surge in tourism. Hmm. Okay. And then, yeah, follow up on the tourism. Best to travel Moldova via Frankfurt was the question. Um, well, as far as I know, I they it, it used to connect in Frankfurt. Um, the the two best connections are in uh, Vienna and in Istanbul. Now I couldn't go to Istanbul because as an American grantee, I have to fly American. American-based carriers as far as I can. So they won't let me fly Turkish Airlines. But if I was flying on my own dime, that's how I would go. I'd go via Istanbul. Okay. Awesome. Well, I um that's about all I have on on my end. I guess there is one one more question in the in the QA there if you see it. Um, about Turkish Romanians or other dis diplomats engaged with the interested parties on Transnistria. Well, I, I I don't know about about Turkish and Romanian specifically, but I know there's been diplomacy about Transnistria, you know, for twenty years, and so and and you know, as far as I know, these talks are ongoing. Uh, the most recent plan. The mo plans the wrong word. The most recent idea talked about uh, replacing the Russian troops with neutral troops, UN troops, something like that. Um, so far, that hasn't gone anywhere, uh, but certainly, you know, there's there's always hope. Uh, but this Transnistrian problem, it's it, it's pretty sticky. Hey, well, Stephen, thank you so much for for taking the time here um, this evening for for you and this afternoon for us. Um, it means means a lot. Um, I personally learned an incredible amount over this last last hour, and and hope that everyone on the call did as well. Um, and and thank you for for your your time and energy that you put into the the presentation. Um, you know, every anybody who. Uh, 
was on the call today that would like to, to revisit this program uh, should be posted to our YouTube page by, by tomorrow. We invite you to, to share it with your network for anyone that you think might, might be curious um, about Moldova. Um, and and we, uh, we look forward to seeing you when, you when you get back to the US, Stephen, but we hope you have a, a great rest of your, your time there in Moldova. And, and thank you again. Um, anybody uh, who's curious about any upcoming IRC events, uh, please please head to our website if you're interested in becoming a member. Um, there's there's links there to to do so, and we will hope to see you um, at a future IRC offering. So thank you so much, everyone, and please enjoy the rest of your day.